Good morning. My name is Manasvini Mohan. I am 17 years old and currently still in school studying for my A-levels. I first heard of the Women's Equality Party while watching a talk given at LSE by the former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard. It just so happens that at that time, I was researching women's underrepresentation in Parliament for a project I was doing in school. And so the notion of a women's equality party intrigued me straight away. As soon as I went home that evening, I googled the Women's Equality Party, or WE as they are known, read up on the work they do, and emailed them with some questions. Very shortly after that, I spent a few days volunteering at the party's London headquarters. During this time, it became clear to me that first and foremost, we aim to remove the obstacles and barriers facing women in Britain today. I decided to become a member, not only because I'm a woman and a feminist, but because I believe the party's work will benefit everyone across our society. Particularly important to me are the changes we want to make in the education system, allowing girls to have the confidence and support of their male counterparts. This goes in hand in hand with our plan to challenge the way the media perceives and objectifies women. I look forward to the Women's Equality Party working alongside the main political parties. In fact, in my ideal world, all MPs would be members of our party and Parliament would have to take gender issues seriously. While we wait for that to happen, we can, together, ensure that women's voices are heard and women's rights are acknowledged across our society. Behind all of this is the brilliant work of party leader Sophie Walker, who I have the great honour of introducing today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. What a wonderful morning. Um, this morning, we take a big step towards doing politics differently, to doing politics fairly, to creating the kind of politics where women and men are heard equally, and Britain does better as a result. I'm Sophie Walker, and I'm the leader of the Women's Equality Party. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Beside me sit some of our members who have worked directly on the policies that we're about to announce. I'm delighted to welcome them today, along with the many, many others here too who have helped us to get to this point. We are truly grateful, and we are inspired by your approach that has been both creative and pragmatic. As I look around this room and consider how far we've traveled, it seems incredible that this wonderful party was set up just six months ago by Sandy Toxvig and Catherine Mayer. <laughs> Together, they came up with the idea of building a new collaborative force in British politics. A collaboration of people of all genders, ages, backgrounds, ethnicities, beliefs and experiences who share the determination to see women enjoy the same rights and opportunities as men so that all can flourish. On behalf of the many thousands who, like me, jumped at the chance to be part of this, I would like to thank Catherine and Sandy, whose courage and vision kick-started our extraordinary journey. Right, it's 2015. It's nearly 100 years since women won the right to vote. And yet, 
men outnumber women in Parliament by two to one. Women's experiences of work, healthcare, crime and education are not heard and our legislation is often lacking and ineffective. Two women are killed by a partner or former partner every week. And for many others, the fear of being attacked is something they live with daily. Our society is not at ease with itself. Women are represented in adverts and the media as sex objects and victims rather than individuals with ambitions and ideas. Our children are held back by the limits imposed on them by gender stereotypes. And our economy is out of balance. It is time to wake up to the real gender pay gap that sits behind so many of the problems women face. Overall, last year, men earned £516 billion and women earned £271 billion. That is a difference of £245 billion. Why? Because millions of women are being paid less than their male colleagues. They are leaving work because they can't afford childcare. They are not returning to work when their children are older because they're now caring for elderly parents. They are working in part-time and unstable jobs because they are the only ones that afford them flexibility. This all adds up not just to a gap in earnings, but a gap in power. When British men earn £245 billion more than British women every year, it is no surprise that women have so little say in our society. We are here to change that. A great many pressure groups and campaigners and individuals have made great progress in fighting for the rights of women in all areas of life. Without the inspirational work of the suffragettes, we would have no women in Parliament at all. Without the dedication of the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and the 1970s, we couldn't hold employers to account over the pay gap because the Equal Pay Act of 1970 wouldn't exist. But instead of celebrating these achievements and continuing to move forward, instead of adopting the recommendations made by today's brilliant women's organisations, of which there are many, British institutions choose instead to look the other way. Our history books neglect female activism and our media lampoons female activists as radical and irrational women whose contributions to political discourse do not deserve to be taken seriously. Recently, the Prime Minister expressed concern that his two daughters would be disadvantaged because of their gender. He said, you can't have true opportunity without real equality. Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, has said, we will never be a successful society in which all are able to achieve their potential until we have equality for women. These are great comments, right? <laughs> They're just comments. They've been talking about delivering equality for far too long. It seems to me they're more interested in claiming the right to deliver equality than actually delivering it. Yeah. Their only action is to shoot down any other party's talk about how they might deliver equality, reducing our right to participate to a cynical messaging contest. Equality is not a manifesto detail to be bickered over. It's not politicians' property to be doled out as they see fit. And we are not a special interest party. We are half the population. Equality belongs to us. The political system belongs to us. We are within our rights to lay claim to both, and that is what we are going to do. We are proposing to finally achieve equality for women, and thereby for everyone, 
by being a political party that works with all the other parties so that we can all move forward together. Sorry, whoops. It's really a shame that this approach is so unique in politics. It really shouldn't be. Now, don't get me wrong. We will not shy away from the big debates. We will campaign hard for votes. We plan to stand our first candidates next spring. But our approach means that we don't have to wait until the next election for change. I'm so tired of waiting for change. We will collaborate. We will work with all those who share our goals. And together, we will build a movement for change. We have six clear objectives to bring about an equal society for the good of everyone. Today, we announced the first of the policies to deliver those objectives. These are policies that our members and supporters have been crafting for months up and down the country in homes and offices, in cafes and community halls in the hope of breaking the political logjam. David Cameron, Jeremy Corbyn, political leaders and activists from every party. If you really want women to fulfill their potential, then take on these policies. We will stand against you at election time, but we challenge you, put us out of business first, implement our policies first, and do it fast. <laughs> some brilliant people about to speak. I'll just say a little more shortly and then I'll hand over to them. I have to say that I am overwhelmed after these months and months of work to be holding this document today. The proposals here are designed to support women right through their lives. So let's start by looking at life for young girls. My younger daughter is six years old. She loves science. I hope she continues to love it. I hope she takes physics at A-level. We heard from a member of our party who took physics at A-level. She was one of two girls in a class of 30. And she wrote to us that in one lesson, her teacher thought it would be funny if he mathematically proved on the board that women are the root of all evil. <laughs> who thinks that's funny? We don't want any girl to feel that she's a joke to her classmates and a joke to her teacher. We want to expand women's options and children's options. We want them and their teachers to understand that it's normal to treat all people as equal. And we say that schools should be judged on the way they teach gender equality and on the way they deliver it. School is, of course, not just the place where children learn to read and write. It's also where they start to form ideas about how relationships work, and it's where they put that into practice. Already, the boys in my little girl's class think she's second class. I don't. I think she's first class, even though she did wake me up three times last night to check it was today I was doing my big speech. <laughs> But I can't bear the thought that sexist, oppressive attitudes are going to accompany her right through school. Like many of you, I'm starting to realise we can do something about it. We can support our children and young people by challenging the idea that some subjects and clothes and toys are for girls and others are for boys. We can provide independent careers advice. We can recognise that aspiration has no gender. We can provide honest sex and relationships education so that our children's first romantic forays are as they should be. Respectful, consensual, joyful, and only embarrassing in the right way. <laughs> this way, we believe that young women and men will be better equipped to go out together into the world. In the world of adults, we expect women and men to enjoy equal pay and equal opportunity. We want to tackle the imbalances that hold women back in the workplace and leave many, such as those who are unpaid caregivers or in low-paid jobs, especially vulnerable. 
We also want to support women in the workforce as they move into their 50s and 60s, tackling the discrimination that older women face and enabling them to maintain a successful and enjoyable career and enjoy security in their retirement. Of course, creating a fairer workplace isn't just about equal pay. It's about supporting everyone, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, to share the joys and responsibilities of parenting and caregiving. It's about freeing families from the exorbitant cost of childcare. One of our members wrote to us, it is my decision to be a stay-at-home mum, she said. I never thought I'd be a mum and I enjoy it immensely. But it saddens me that I have been out of the workforce for such a long time that getting a job that doesn't just pay for childcare is nigh on impossible. I want my daughter and daughters everywhere to realise their potential. This woman is one of at least 600,000 women in Britain who would prefer to work if they could afford to do so. We want women to realise their potential and we want to do it by providing a system of childcare that doesn't cost the earth and doesn't have to be waited for. We believe that government funded childcare should be available for all children from the end of paid parental leave and we believe this is a key area for government investment. We would fully fund this by introducing a single rate of tax relief on pension savings, which would free up around six and a half billion pounds. This will support women as they build their careers and start families, but it also protects women who are low earners and part-time workers to save for their pensions. By enabling women to earn more, we can enable them to save more. And only by doing both can we solve the problem of women's poverty pensions and ensure dignity in retirement for all. I've talked a lot about mothers here. It's important to look also at the way we treat fathers and fathers-to-be. Just as women's careers suffer because it's assumed they will take parental leave, men's family lives suffer when it's assumed that they won't. We want more fathers to take more parental leave and we're going to make it more affordable for them to do so. We will also provide greater support to same-sex parents, adoptive parents, and single parents. And we will encourage more fathers to take time away from work by changing attitudes around who can and who should care. Our aim is to make women free and equal. But no woman can be free and equal unless she is safe. It is a stain on our society that women are murdered, violated, assaulted and oppressed because of their gender. By diminishing women's freedom to participate in society, violence against, me, uh, against women and girls remains one of the highest barriers to gender equality. Sometimes, feeling free from sexual violence means just being able to walk down the street in peace. Another of our members told us, I want to know what it feels like to come home at night without fearing being attacked. I don't want to be catcalled in the street. I don't want to be belittled and told to smile, darling. Our country has a gendered culture where men are seen as entitled to dominate and the media portrays women as sex objects. The acts of everyday sexism that pervade our culture must not be trivialised. They must be challenged and they must be defeated. Violence against women and girls, of course, goes much deeper than everyday sexism. The Women's Equality Party believes in the absolute right to a place of sanctuary for women, children, and other survivors of sexual and domestic violence. And we recognise the importance of specialist services for women from black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities, for women with disabilities, and for women with insecure immigration status. It is essential to fund support services to help women rebuild their lives. And we must address the shamefully low prosecution rates for domestic and sexual violence. We must also tackle the awful abuse and exploitation that occurs in the sex trade. The Women's Equality Party joins those who believe that women should never be criminalised for selling sex. 
It is time to begin a process in the United Kingdom to end demand for prostitution. First, we must invest in the support services and opportunities that women need to exit the sex industry. And we must drive a national conversation about the reality of the sex industry as both a cause and a consequence of gender inequality. And then, within two years, we should legislate to criminalise the purchase of sex. Our policies support ordinary women and help them to overcome the challenges of living and working in a structurally sexist society. The problems I've outlined this morning would not be so profound if women were equal decision makers in the United Kingdom, if they were proportionately represented in politics and business and throughout working life. We've made some progress, but the path to shared power is taking too long to pave. So we have concluded that as a temporary measure, quotas are necessary. Women currently make up a third of Parliament. So we will put Parliament into special measures for two elections. <laughs> Political parties should field women in two thirds of seats, including two thirds of safe seats. We can have a 50 50 Parliament in a decade. In business, similarly, we expect balance. We want to see a balanced board and a balanced executive committee at all listed companies by 2025 with progress from now. Yeah. This will not, as the scaremongers suggest, permit mediocrity. <laughs> Rather, it will stamp it out. It will eradicate the centuries-old system of unwritten quotas, which have created institutions in which a wealthy, white, male elite wields far more power than the rest of us. Britain's refusal to accept difference creates mediocrity. We have 30 million women in the country. I'm sure we can find 325 brilliant ones to become MPs. <laughs> I'm sure we can find many, many more to lead and inspire in our workplaces. I'm going to break off here to introduce some of the people who have created our policies to tell you a bit more about them. So please welcome Catherine Riley, who's going to be talking about equality in the media. Thanks, Sophie. My name is Catherine Riley. Six months ago, I heard about the Women's Equality Party and I put my hand up to help. I didn't expect to be handed the task of coordinating the media policy area, <laughs> but that serves me right for underestimating how consultative and cooperative the party's methods of drawing up its aims and how to achieve them would be. On the CV I sent to Sophie was listed my work in magazine journalism over many years and my academic research into women's representation, writing and publication. For a long time, I've been reading and reading about journalism that sidelines women, that sexualizes women, and that is reliant on a male-centric news agenda from which women are largely excluded. We aim to change that. I've also watched TV content that doesn't represent me or the women I know. Where are the women whose families aren't nuclear? The black female bosses who aren't tokens? the disabled women not participating in the Paralympics, and the successful single women who don't have a drink problem. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Such content also, just as importantly, stereotypes men in ways that limit all of us. And we aim to change that. I have looked for, but not found, equal coverage of women playing sports. I have looked for, but not found, fashion and beauty photography that shows women with a healthy BMI. <laughs> I have looked for, but not found, safe spaces online where hashtagging the word feminism doesn't immediately invite vitriol and invective. And we aim to change that. For starters, we will say no to disrespect and mobilize our supporters to challenge reporting that undermines women, whether by trivializing violence, reinforcing harmful stereotypes, or retouching photos in order to distort our ideas of how real women should look. Given the growing significance of social media, we also call for stronger and better enforced rules on trolling and online abuse. Media cooperation is critical to achieving equality. So, think on. Because while legislative change is vitally important, cultural change is also essential if we are to shift the way gender works in this country. That's why I put my hand up six months ago. I was tired of talking and writing about these issues, and I wanted to act. I believe these policies and the Women's Equality Party itself will make real changes to our media and to our country and our culture in the months and years ahead. I can't wait for that change. I'll now hand over to Lily Borton, who will introduce our policies on equal education for all children. I'm Lily. I've recently finished a degree in maths with Spanish at Royal Holloway and I join a list of female alumni as inspiring as suffragette Emily Davison, novelist George Eliot, and Elizabeth Blackwell, the first female doctor in the UK and in the US. Royal Holloway was founded as a college for women in 1886 in recognition of the extraordinary social benefits of women's education. But 130 years later, we still have work to do to achieve true gender equality in education. That's one of the reasons that when I heard a party for women's equality was being started, I knew I had to get involved. I went along to the education policy evening held in Bath, and it was a really amazing experience. We began by talking about what education would look like free from gender inequality. We decided that individuals would be valued without gender stereotyping and unconscious bias. We decided that it would be normal to study what you're interested in, irrespective of your gender. We decided that gender stereotypes would be eradicated in toys, books, and in attitudes. A group of younger people split off to talk about the issues we face in education today and we kept coming back to a lack of good quality personal, social and health education, a pressing need for serious education in relationships, mental health, consent and entitlement. We then went on to talk about how we would tackle these issues, and I am really proud that many of our recommendations are included in this document today, especially... <laughs> especially in sex and relationships education, which should be taken as seriously as any other subject. <laughs> and I know that sex and relationships education can alarm people, particularly for younger children, but what we are talking about is helping young people learn about themselves and understand how to build and maintain healthy relationships. Empowering young people through education will ensure that they are in the driving seat of their own lives and relationships. And that's what we are striving to achieve. I'm now going to hand over to Gizemma, sorry. Gizemma Garrett and Duncan Fisher, who are going to talk about equal parenting. It has been
been my privilege to lead on the working group for equal parenting and caregiving. The working group, consisting of men and women, were tasked with the job of thinking about the existing barriers to equality at home and identifying achievable solutions. I am a mother who talks about fathers for a living. It's a strange job. <laughs> for 15 years, I've campaigned for equality in parenting, and there has been some slight movement but nothing like this. This, this is amazing. I've been a campaigner for equality for 18 years, since the day that my first daughter was born and I created the Fatherhood Institute. From the earliest stage, we knew that equality for women depended on men becoming closer to their children. I served on the board of the Equal Opportunities Commission, where my job was to focus on the question of who cares for children. But since 2008, the debate has gone dead. Both Jez and I, and a handful of others, have been writing and advocating the whole way through, but nobody has been reading or listening. And suddenly, we arrives and puts caring fairly and squarely on the table, just like they did in other European countries a generation ago. And here I am, a father of two daughters, actually part of this launch. This moment is one of the most significant in my 18 years of this work, and I still can't believe it. <laughs> a new way of talking and thinking about parenting and caring. Equal paid leave for both parents, including same-sex parents, allows choice within the family. It starts the wider culture change of caring and will change things significantly in the workplace. Paying men 90% of their wages for six weeks gives a definite message. Their role in caring for their own children is taken seriously and valued. <laughs> Imagine the difference in the workplace when men and women are viewed as equally likely to take time off when they become parents. Imagine the future expectations of boys and girls who have seen mums and dads share caring responsibility equally. Imagine how this simple shift in the leave system can encourage a wider attitudinal shift. It says clearly that all parents matter to their children, to the workplace and to, to, to society. Men are hardwired to care for their children just as women are. Yet we rarely see this reflected in policy. No more images of men as incompetent carers, uninterested or lacking specific skills which women are born with. <laughs> it is a total myth, one that puts on fair pressure on mothers, as well as underestimates fathers. We will reform services, both public and private, to make it clear that a parent's gender or sexual orientation does not determine their ability to care for their child. We talks about parenting as a joy, and it talks about the need to share it equally. Wow. <laughs> no other gender equality advocate or political party is saying anything like that. 
By focusing only on equality in work and in public life, we have devalued shared caring. We has turned all that on its head. Now, caring has equal status with work, and we are thinking about equality in caring. This is little short of a revolution in equality thinking in the UK. These policies reflect the needs, expectations and aspirations of men and women to care for their children. We can have it all, but only when we're in it together. And now, for the first time, it feels like we genuinely can be. I would now like to introduce Alex Mitzi, who will talk about equal pay. My name is Alex Mitzi, and I'm an employment lawyer specialising in equality and discrimination. And I'm tremendously proud to have been involved in developing the policies that you'll hear about today. As a lawyer, I like legal solutions. I like it when we make effective laws and people abide by them. But in this case, the laws we have aren't working. The Equal Pay Act has been on the statute books for 45 years. The Sex Discrimination Act for nearly 40 but women still earn far less than men and the pace of change is slowing. The gender pay gap is 19%. To put that into context for you, from now, today, until the new year, women are working for free. I, for one, can think of better things to do with my time. <laughs> The reasons for this are clear and well known. Women who have children or other caring responsibilities suffer a massive financial penalty which persists throughout their working lives. Women are overrepresented in lower paid jobs and sectors and underrepresented in highly paid jobs. These are often lazily dismissed as women's lifestyle choices, as if women choose to be poor. But women don't make choices in a vacuum. Our choices are constrained by social and financial barriers, and that's something we can change with political will and with the policies that we're launching today. We've consulted with businesses and civil society. We've had the input of many, many people across the country, and we have concluded that change is not just possible, but essential. Our policies will bring pay disparities into the open and force them to be addressed. We'll require employers to be more flexible and we will spread caring responsibilities more equally so that women have genuine choices about their lives. We recognise that we need to take businesses with us and work with them, not just lecture from the sidelines. And we're keenly aware that women are more likely to do low-paid work, more likely to suffer because of government cuts, and more likely to retire in poverty. And so our policies are pragmatic and focused on achieving our goals and improving women's lives. In my work, I often see how women's potential is wasted how they hit brick walls because their work is undervalued, because now, in 2015, they still have to choose between their job and their family. But I also see how businesses and individuals thrive when women are able to participate and progress. The conclusion is inescapable. Neither our economy nor our society can afford to undervalue women's work. And I'd now like to introduce Nimco Ali, who will be talking about violence against women. Thank you. My name is Nimco Ali, and I'm an activist and the co-founder of Daughters of Eve, a non-for-profit organization that works with girls at risk of female genital mutilation. 
As some of you might know, I was subjected to FGM at the age of seven. But it was not until 2003 that the loopholes that allowed this act of violence to be committed against British girls and women like me overseas was closed. If we had equal numbers of women in positions of decision-making power and survivors' voices were heard, it would be less likely for these loopholes to exist. My reasons for joining WE were intensely personal and intensely political because these things go together. <laughs> Two of my sisters will this week lose their lives at the hands of a current or ex-partner. There, there is a young girl or a young woman out there wondering whether the dress she wore last night or how much she had to drink was the reason why she got raped. If nothing changes, my four-year-old niece will grow up with the same daily deluge of media that represents her as a second-class citizen. And her peers in Britain and around the world will be subjected to assault, exploitation, trafficking, and many other forms of violence daily. Too often, politicians pretend that violence against women and girls is something that's always happened and always will. We don't believe that. With better education about consent, respect, and a strong stance against the trivialization of violence in the media and through strengthening the criminal justice system, we can fight back. <laughs> In the meantime, we'll, we will provide survivors of all forms of violence with the support they need by increasing funding for shelters, rape crisis centers, legal aid, and family counseling. We recognize that survivors of, we, 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 sorry, we recognize that, cyber, that, that survivors have diverse needs and experiences, that women from black, Asian, and ethnic minority communities have distinct needs as do women with disabilities and insecure immigration status. And, and so do women living in poverty or those suffering from addiction. Okay. Yeah. So I've just lost my notes, but there you go. There it is. Um, I wish I could say that I woke up one day and thought I really wanted to change the world and become a campaigner. But ultimately, I came face to face too often with the results of my silence about FGM and how that was complacent. Some of my experience in political lobbying and working with those who, um, and working with those who don't understand the needs of survivors have been as painful as, my dis as, as, as the dismissal of my experience as a child. Speaking out is not only about changing our political landscape, it's about letting individuals claim ownership of their lives. And through thousands of individual voices, we can create the change. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Ona Baba, who will be talking about equal representation. I'm Honor, I'm 17, and I co-founded the Hampstead and Kilburn branch of the Women's Equality Party. Yeah. I got involved, like thousands of others, because we've had enough. We're meant to be happy with just 29% of MPs being women. We're meant to be happy with just 25% of FTSE 100 boards involving women. We're meant to be happy with more women reporting sexual violence, though the numbers of assaults are rising dramatically. We're meant to be happy with the idea that we can do anything, but still we're taught that our appearance matters the most. We're meant to be happy with the Equal Pay Act, though women are still guaranteed to get paid 19% less than men. We're 51% of the population, and we're not happy. <laughs> We can't keep waiting for a little percentage increase. We need proper representation, and we need it now. 
The policies we are launching today will take a bold new approach to finally achieving equal representation. Through policies in politics and business, including the Help to Fly initiative, we are supporting women entrepreneurs to start their own businesses and young women getting into politics. As a party, we've decided to achieve our goals, we need quotas. Quotas might be scary, but still not achieving equality when I'm 80 and most of you are dead is much, much scarier. <laughs> As Sophie said, quotas are a short-term measure to ensure that in 10 years' time, this conversation will be over, because we'll have a 50-50 parliament and equal representation of women on boards. And we'll be able to stop being happy with 20% of representation, but our rightful 50. This changes the world for women of my generation. Instead of apologetically getting on with jobs while men are promoted above them, Young women will be able to see the possibility of becoming board members, regardless of their gender. It is true. <laughs> it is true that someone who isn't a woman can represent women. However, in a country where we are still taxed for having periods and women in politics are told to calm down, you have to question whether women are being represented properly. The answer, <laughs> the answer, they aren't. Having equal representation in Parliament will not only encourage young women into politics, but will ensure that representation, the most fundamental part of democracy, is properly carried out. We can ensure, by women gaining equal representation, that women of my generation won't have to worry that if they get to the top, their dresses and nails will be more important than their brains and ideas. For the young girls... <laughs> for the young girls who come after us, for our own daughters, will never have a shortage of strong, successful women to look up to. This means there will come a time when the idea of gender inequality will be just as ridiculous as women's complete lack of representation from all areas of public life. This isn't an easy fight. The Women's Equality Party is distracting me from my studies. <laughs> to be here, I've had to get permission to skip an English lesson, and I've also spoken at events past nine o'clock on a school night. <laughs> the Women's Equality the Women's Equality Party may be inconvenient, but the idea that in 10 years we could have a country where gender equality exists is worth the inconvenience. Today, we've come a step closer to ensuring our children will never have to skip school for gender equality. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. If you, like me, are tired of waiting for equality, stop waiting. Join us. Join in. We are already making a difference. And the bigger we are, the more difference we will make. Thank you very much. <laughs>